Okay? All right, so let, while y'all are eating, let me try to uh, lighten it up a little bit. There's, a, there's an old Confederate saying that we've carried from Clifton, from the river, all over basically the United States and Canada as Civil War reenactors. And this story was given to us by an old gentleman that used to live here in Clifton. Excuse me. And this is what he used to ask us. If you're a true Southerner, you can answer these two questions. First question, there's two days of the week that start with the letter T. What are they? Today. Yes, sir. Tuesday and Thursday. Thank you, sir. Today what else tomorrow. are they? Today and tomorrow. Today and tomorrow. This lady right. Let's hear it before. <laughs> All right. Now, there was this old gentleman that enjoyed telling time. And he used the sun and the moon. But he met his first pocket watch. And they told him that there were 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour. Well, that fascinated him. So he got to try to figure out how many seconds there was in a year. Does anybody know, have a guess, close guess, how many seconds there are in one year? Yes. That's a good guess, too. It really is. Thank you. Anybody else got a guess? All right, we're not going to burn a lot of time on it. Yes, ma'am. Seconds are 12 of them. Jackie, there you right? are. This lady. This lady's on top of it. There's 12 <laughs> seconds in a year. January 2nd, February 2nd, March the 2nd. All right. So there's your two Confederate adages that you will remember long, long from now. All right, we're going to get into this thing. Clifton has got a very great reputation and history. The difference with Clifton and most other southern towns that we research is that Clifton not only has real estate, but it also has water. It has the Tennessee River. The Tennessee River brought most of Clifton's Civil War history to it from one end or the other, okay? Now, last time y'all asked me to come down here, we talked a lot about the last deep water port, the Port of Aeneas, where it was located, so on and so forth, all that. Today, we're going to talk about this river channels open all the way to the Muscle Shoals, okay, to Florence. Now, please remember, when you got to Florence, you were done, okay? They didn't have anything yet that could come over those Muscle Shoals upstream to Decatur, Alabama, a little above Decatur. So, when those Yankee boats of destruction came into our waterway, they had to turn around at Florence. The Yankee boats above the Muscle Shoals could come down to Decatur, and then they had to turn around and go back, try to get back towards Chattanooga. The same thing existed for the Confederate boats. A lot of people have a hard time understanding that the Confederacy had built a navy in a short window, and it didn't last long, regrettably enough. But what those boats were capable of doing and what they were hauling and where their cargo came from, again, below that Muscle Shoals, is a piece of historical research that's not complete. By any means, it's not complete. We know what happened to all the boats. There were 11 of them, minimum of 11. I have all the names. I have most of the skippers named. I have the weight and length of them. It take a long time to go through all that, but if y'all decide you want it, that's another day. I can share all that with you. I can share with you what happened to those boats. They all vanished in one month. 
in one week of one month. February 1862. That's where we're going to start. Right now and move forward. In February 1862, there were three forts, Confederate forts. Fort Heitman, across the Tennessee River. Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson. Fort Donaldson being on the Cumberland River, which is a national park now, like Shiloh, a buried land between the lakes or next to Dover, Tennessee, at land between the lakes. Fort Henry is underwater now, inside land between the lakes and the Tennessee River. Fort Henry and Fort Heitman fell to the federal first. Fort Donaldson never had to fall. But the four Confederate generals that were in charge of Fort Donaldson basically decided two could leave and two had to stay, the generals. And the two that stayed were the worst choices possible and they surrendered to Fort. For no reason, no reason. Anyway, between the fall of Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson, we got about a two-week period in February 1862. Commodore Foote, y'all all heard that name, I know. Yankee Army, Yankee Navy, Commodore Foote. He sent a flotilla, first time, up the Tennessee River from the mouth to destroy any Confederate stores, ships, and people in the river and on the banks of the river. Those three ships were made up of the Lexington, the Tyler, and the Costatoga, commanded by a young captain at the time uh, excuse me, a young lieutenant at the time by the name of Phelps. This is the book he wrote as an old man. If you want to read about the river right out here in the Civil War in Clifton, right there it is. You order it off the internet. It is worth reading. What's Very that? much so, okay? What's the name of the book? Ironclad Captain. Ironclad Captain. Now let me say, before you spend the money on this, there's not near as much information in here about Clifton as you want there to be. There's only about three paragraphs, and that's all, okay? But if you do your research, it'll tie into all of this. There's a lot missing here, a lot. All right, now, with that being said, the Lexington Tyler and the Costa Toga were all wood clads. They weren't no tin clads. The Elfin and the Undine, which we'll get on the Undine later, USS 54, USS 55, they were tin clads. The USS 55, the Undine, ripped her belly out right out here in the river. A nine-foot gash in it and sunk. No, it did not float down to Beach Creek Island. It had a nine-foot gash in it. It sunk right off the bank. That's where the legend comes from that there's a cannon lost in Ross Creek. That's not true. They did unload the cannons, but they got them all back. Okay, so anyway. So we had wood clads, we had cotton clads, we had tin clads, and we had iron clads. And several different classes inside the iron clads. Things like rams, different things, mortar boats, a lot of different things, okay? But right now, in the beginning of the war, those three boats that came up this river to basically McFarland Park in Florence was the Costa Toga, the Lexington, and the Tyler. The Lexington being the largest and the slowest of the three. It was a very slow, old boat. Now, at the same time that was going on, our 11 Confederate boats were all cotton clads. What is a cotton clad? It's a wooden paddle wheeler, stern wheel paddle wheeler, 
that they stack cotton bales up all the way around on all three levels of the decks. And they worked inside those. It, it was bulletproof, but it sure wasn't fireproof. It burned like a match. Okay? So those 11 boats, part of them made it, all three of them actually, made it all the way to Florence, outrunning the Federals, and warning everybody on the banks as they went, hey, the Yankees is right behind us. You better do something. This is in February 62, and the deckhands on these Confederate boats were jumping into the frozen river and swimming to the bank and warning the civilians of what was coming. Now think about that for a moment. Also think about this. The river was flooded. It was everywhere in February 62. It was a huge flood. Clifton was flooded. There was only one road accessible out of here, just like in 1974, I think, three, yes sir. Couldn't remember. One road was accessible, I believe was the story. That same thing, okay. Now people have written, I'm not gonna name names, I'm not. We're not gonna point fingers, but people have written Many, many articles about that February 62 ordeal and how afraid people were of those oncoming Yankee ships. They were scared to death. It was, it was called, it, it, it received a title and this is where those other people try to pick when this happened. It was called the Great Mud Retreat because the roads that wasn't underwater were total mud. And it took everything they had to get their families out of here before those Yankee boats got here and everybody left. There are people, scholars from the past, all the way back to the war, that try to confuse us and say when the Great Mud Retreat actually happened, that it can't not be documented in February 1862. That's totally wrong. The Clarksville newspaper, Clarksville, Tennessee newspaper, at the time on the Cumberland River basically states the Great Mud Retreat is in effect now for every river because Foote has sent out a flotilla on all the rivers of Tennessee. And people were going everywhere. <clears throat> all right. Um, let me, uh, let me read you an account of, uh, of the Great Mud Retreat, okay? And uh, we, uh, <clears throat> we'll try to, I'm looking at another shelling of Clifton right now. We don't want that. And so this is what Lieutenant Gwynn Again, this is Lieutenant Phelps. He is on the Lexington. Lieutenant Gwynn is on another sister ship, brother ship, whatever. This is what he says on the eighth day of February in his official report about Clifton. Lieutenant Gwynn is reporting as a lieutenant in the U.S. Navy, and I apologize, he's commanding the USS Tyler. The note that he left concerning Clifton was that they stopped on their way back from Florence and they seized wheat and flour in this town for, for the Confederates. And learning that a large quantity of wheat and flour was stored in Clifton 
He intended, of course, to be shipping it to the south, a large portion of it having been brought from the bought from a firm in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, on my way down, I landed there at Clifton and took on board about a thousand sacks and a hundred barrels of flour and 6,000 6, bushels of wheat. I consider it my duty to take possession to prevent it from being seized by the rebels or disposed of in rebel country. Okay? The reference to that is William Gwynn, Lieutenant Commanding uh, um, Foot to Wales, Secretary of War, 7 February 1862, a hymen to W.W. McFall, 8 February 1862, in the official record of the war of the Navy Series 1, 22, page 537 through 539, and 566 through 567. I reference everything I tell you. You can look at my references. You can look it up and read it for yourself, okay? Now, there is a man that I want to introduce you to that's from Clifton, okay? Some of you in this room have heard of him, and some of you haven't, but after today, you're going to know him. <coughs> Bear with me while I find him. And uh, he uh, he's well worth hearing. He really, he really is. And... Uh, he, uh, um, bear with me. I had some of these pages earmarked and I've lost them now. So, uh, <clears throat> here we go. Here we go. Um, there was a gentleman as a little boy that was raised in this town down on Hardin's Creek. And his name was John A. Pitts. Okay, and as an old man or a senior citizen, whatever, John A. Pitts became a federal judge in Nashville. Um, you, some of you in here may be very familiar with this name. Uh, Waller, Lanson, Dorsch, and Davis law firm in Nashville, Tennessee today. Mr. Pitts founded it. He's from Clifton. This is what he said. This is the very first encounter with Yankees in Clifton. Very first. And now before. He says, on the 6th of February, 1862, the U.S. gunboats began their first destructive Tennessee River voyage from the mouth of the river as far upstream as Florence, Alabama. The flotilla was composed of the gunboat Costatoga, Lexington, and Tyler. <coughs> On the 7th day of February, 1862, I, as a boy, future judge John A. Pitts, who lived near Clifton on Hardin's Creek during the war, well remember the sounds of the calliopes on the ships being purposely out of tune. When they heard calliopes being played on the river boats, they rushed to the bank of the river here in Clifton because they knew, the children knew, and I guess old people too, that there was going to be something good to see. And if they was playing a certain song, they knew there was a circus coming to town. But these calliopes were being played deliberately out of tune, and they had never heard anything like that. The sound of out of tune calliope music floating up from the river. One day, as a group of boys played in a cotton field, at first they thought a circus was coming to town. But as they climbed to the top of the bluff, the boys saw smoke rising from the vicinity of Clifton. And then the source of the music hove into view. A gunboat whose guns had just shelled the town of Clifton. Yankee Lieutenant Commander S.L. Phelps, this guy, captain of the Costatoga, 
left a fascinating account of that initial voyage into the heartland of the Confederacy. Reporting from his position on the Tennessee River on February the 10th, 1862, the, the Confederates have no intention of simply handing control of the Tennessee River and their towns back over to the Union. Lieutenant Gwynn, commanding the USS Tyler gunboat on reconnaissance of the Tennessee River from Eastport, Mississippi to the mouth of the river, which took on a seizure at Clifton, Tennessee of 6,000 bushels of wheat and 1,100 sacks of flour, anyway. So there's you an account from a federal judge many, many years after the initial bombardment that brought Clifton into the war. In this, in this document, I have 42 confirmed, 42 confirmed military action in this town. 42. Now we can go through every one of them. You know, four of them is going to be Forrest crossing General Nathan Bedford Forrest crossing the river, going or coming, going or coming. Everybody knows about that. The things that you need to know about that is almost impossible to find is, and we touched on it last time I was here, and I'm just going to lightly touch on it this time. Again, go to your local cemeteries. Please go. Please. And search for young men that would be of battle age during 1862. <coughs> that would be anywhere from 14 years old to 40 years old in 1862. They're not there. Trust me, they're not here. They're not in these cemeteries. I don't care which creek you go up. They're not there. Where are they? The 6th Tennessee Company F on the 6th day of April First day of the Battle of Shiloh at 6 a.m. in the morning. Got annihilated. Every member but the adjutant and the captain of that unit, every member was from Clifton. That's where they're at it's in a mass grave at Shiloh. Thank goodness they had children before they left. Thank goodness. Yes, it's documented. Yes. Now, this guy's name was, was Captain John Newsom. He was originally from Jackson, Tennessee. That's where he's buried at today. When, when he felt he had this really bad guilt trip about taking all the young men from this area and Perry County, and part of Perry County was from the 23rd Tennessee, so he had this bad guilt trip. Now, he was wounded bad, and he was sent here. He was sent here. Some of them were sent to Lynn. They were sent to a lot of different places to get well. And eventually, he was given the rank of colonel and formed a cavalry battalion with no guns. You're in a war, and you got a cavalry unit formed, but nobody give you any guns? because they didn't have any to give. There's some books that are for sale in the, in the uh, museum in Savannah, Tennessee. One of them is called The Yankee Slayers. Decent book. R read it, and it, it'll touch on that a little bit. He followed a Yankee cavalry unit for seven nights. And on the seventh night, he jumped them out here at Indian Creek, him and his men, and took their guns away from them. And of course, you know, made waste with the men, okay? And got their horses and supplies and so on and so forth. And then he was a very positive force for the Clifton area for a long time. But he is the one single-handedly 
that caused a lot of grief to come to this town and Carol. Both. A Michigan unit that was stationed in Jackson came across the river one night, big stone ground, and they were led by some homeboys that had, was wearing the blue, but they were from this area. And they came in this town, y'all, and they, they leveled it. They burned it to the ground. And of his men, there were 60 of Newsom's men they did not kill. And they took them as prisoner of the war. Excuse me. Colonel Newsom was so badly shot up, they left him laying in the streets in the snow to bleed to death. He didn't. He lived because of the snow. Flowed down, slowed down the blood flow from the wounds. And he lived. Unbelievable how he did it, but he did it. But Clifton was burnt to the ground, minus two buildings, two, only two. The Masonic Lodge that sits behind City Hall over there, or did, in the parking lot back there, and the Presbyterian Church right down here. The Masonic Lodge is gone, the Presbyterian Church is still here. It's the only building you got. All right. A lot of people's familiar with that story, okay? And that's a good thing. But if you want and if you got time, I'm going to run through some of the other battles, okay? And they're pretty heated battles. And you have something that no one else has. You have a siege before Clifton was burnt. There was a great Confederate colonel, and yes, he was from Wayne County. His name was Big Jake Biffle. Big Jake Biffle had been our sheriff before the Civil War. After the Civil War, he went to Texas because he couldn't live here. Because of a gentleman that became a federal judge from Decatur County that's known as Fielding Hurst. Fielding Hurst promised he would hang him. So he had to go to Texas. He got out there in a farm accident and killed himself. Anyway, uh, Big Jake Biffle put a siege on Clifton. <laughs> and it was a very successful siege. Now here is the point we got to get across. We got to get this across. This is the most important part of today. We'll talk about all the rest of the battles and all the shelling and everything, but this siege, we got to make sure that old Tim tells it right, reads it right. So I'm going to turn to it right quick. Bear with me. Now, we're jumping all over the calendar. This siege took place from the 22nd to the 31st of July, 1864. Okay, so, you know, it started on the 22nd and it ended on the 31st. It's a long siege. The Stockade Hill got built up here and, come, and the man that built it, the general that built it, last name was Gillum. I don't think any kin to Freddie, but whatever, you know. <laughs> Freddie would deny it if it was. But anyhow. A Freddie's friend of mine. Anyhow, yeah. so without, I mean, I can tell you day by day what happened during that siege. If y'all want to hear it, I'll do it. But basically, halfway through the siege, the commander of your uh, uh, Stockade Hill here in Clifton was a Colonel Murphy, a Union Colonel Murphy. And his executive officer was Major James M. Dickerson, okay? Now, so when this siege broke out, Murphy was a cop. I mean, it is what it is. So Murphy told Dickerson, on the third day of the siege, I gotta leave. 
I gotta go. And Dickerson was like, where are you going? Well, I've got to go get reinforcements. Well, we got a telegraph right there. Tap on the telegraph and tell them. We got a river right there. There's going to be a gunboat coming along pretty quick. Well, I got to go. So he took three companies that Dickerson could not do without at all because when Big Jake Biffle come to do the siege, his unit by itself had almost a thousand cavaliers with him. And he brought another regiment with him. And they put they encircled Clifton. All right, Diggerson leaves. Diggerson takes off and heads to section 54. Please remember that. It was a hard come up with of the, it's in another book I don't have with me today, I'm sorry. The name of the railroad that ran <laughs> from south from Nashville through Centerville and <clears throat> the area that uh, they got to was section 54, okay? Which means a lot back then. It's like a, a fort there, okay? And so Dickerson, <clears throat> excuse me, Murphy, the colonel of Stockade Hill, got to Section 54. Before he got to Section 54, he stopped in Centerville. Well, <clears throat> Colonel Biffle, I mean, he's a gambler. Colonel Biffle sent two companies after him, but kind of detoured up through Waynesboro instead of going through Linden and got a whole bunch more reinforcements. So that's where the Battle of uh, Centerville comes from. That's how Centerville's courthouse got burnt because of the siege of Clifton. It's all documented. And so Murphy instead of turning and, and going on to Nashville, he went for the railroad and there wasn't no train there. So he got to section 54 and here come Big Jake Bivel again. Or his Ben, Big Jake wasn't there, he was here. And, and uh, there was a sergeant by the last name of Big Jake's, his last name was uh, Cross, C-R-O-S-S. -S. Cross was in charge. And Cross had every intention of crucifying this colonel right there and basically bringing his head back to Big Jake. Whatever happened at 54, nobody knows. But Murphy got away and his men. And instead of going to Nashville, he comes back to Clifton. So all of that was for naught. And it cost several men their lives. So he gets back to Clifton. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, the USS 55 shows up at Clifton with a whole different regiment on board. The boat, the gunboat, Yankee gunboat. And as it's repositioning on the bank right over here, about where the Cross High Cricket sits, it ripped a nine-foot gash in her and sunk right there. They had to take everything off of it, everything off of it. Now, please remember, all this is in the same siege, the burning of the courthouse in Centerville, Section 54, Blockhouse, back to Clifton, siege still going on. The Undine shows up. She rips her belly out. She sinks. <laughs> the commander of the Undine gets in a rowboat with two men and heads out down the river to go get help. They're scared to death because the rumor is, and it's probably true, but it's only a rumor, that Colonel Biffle is holding this siege for General Forrest to get up here and take Clifton back once and for all and get rid of the stockade over here. Once and for all. He never does show up until 
We'll get to that in a minute. So the little champ shows up with a whole flotilla of gunboats in a couple of days, and they pump the Undine out. They put divers down, patch the nine-foot hole, and pump the water out of the Undine and raise it right here at Clifton. Here comes the big part. All of this we've talked about ain't the big part. Here comes the big part. That should put, should have always put Clifton on the historical map. Bill has to leave. And you've all heard, oh, the Battle of Clifton ended at the ski slope. Sure did, because that's where Bill's headquarters was. And when they started moving their artillery in force toward that area, yeah, Bilbo was a smart man. He went to Indian Creek, where Mr. Lee Moser's farm is, was, is, whatever, and, and uh, leaked his wounds over there. And Forrest shows up two days later. Hey, I thought you were running the siege. You've been sending couriers to me that you've got a siege going on at Clifton. Why are you on Indian Creek? Why are you not at Clifton? That's where Biffle and Forrest almost kill one another over that very thing. Biffle somehow got his coup because of a colonel named Kelly from Ashland, Tennessee. He stopped them before they did do something that wasn't going to be good. And Colonel Kelly explained to him what had happened. Forrest said, I won't have any part of that. And he said, it didn't matter if you do or not, it's done happened. Forrest goes across the river again at Clifton, runs up the backside, captures the Undine. A lot of you know this story. His men didn't know how to drive a river boat. Was left a tin glad, but they got on there. They wrecked it. They, they did wreck it, so it was out of commission. And they get up on top of a hill across the river from the biggest Yankee supply depot on the Tennessee River, and that's at Johnsonville, and they shell it with artillery and set it on fire and destroy it. And that's a state park known as Pilot Knob. And Johnsonville is a state park actually a federal park. And Clifton is the very reason that state park and that federal park exist. Because if it hadn't been for the siege of Clifton, none of that would ever happen. You're sitting on a gold mine, folks. It just takes the politics. All right, enough. That's the siege of Clifton. All right, anyway, so we did the burning of Clifton. We've done the siege of Clifton. The two largest, and I did this last time, we're not gonna get hung up on this. The two largest embarkation, de-embarkation, Union troops anywhere in the United States of America off of the inner river was the same place. McPherson's Corps and 17th Corps and 23rd Corps, I think it is without looking it up. Uh, one was before Sherman's march to the sea after the Battle of Atlanta. I think it was McPherson. The other one was after Nashville, Tennessee fell in the winter of 18, January 1865. One got off the boats. The other one got on the boat and went and finished up Lee in Virginia. It happened right here in Clifton. The largest army to ever get off of river boats and the largest army to ever get on river boats in an inner river in the United States of America, right here, documented. Just saying. You're sitting on a gold mine. You really are. Anyway, here we go. We're going to name a whole bunch of battles in Clifton now <coughs> for the fun of it. All right. Ooh, let me find them. All right, here we go. This is a partial list for 1863 only. 
We're not doing 1862, we're not doing 1864, and we're not doing 1865. And we're not talking about forest crossing the river. Not gonna do it, because everybody knows about that. January 1st, 1863, skirmish at Clifton, Tennessee, with the 6th Tennessee U.S. Is, uh, U.S. Cavalry. The Union losses, one man wounded, six men killed. No count on the Confederates. Two January, 1863. Skirmish at Clifton. Union unknown. Of course, Confederate unknown. Three January, 1863. Skirmish at Clifton. 18th Illinois Infantry. They had to march here. We don't know the casualty rates. 10 January 1863. Skirmish in Clifton. 15th Illinois Infantry. <clears throat> 17th through the 20th of February 1863. 3rd Michigan Cavalry. Company A, B, K, and L, and the Second Tennessee Cavalry Detachment fighting right here in Clifton. 20 February 1863, Battle of Clifton, Third Michigan Cavalry. Uh, 24 May 1863, Battle at Clifton, Sixth Tennessee Cavalry. 17 February 1863. Uh, 14 men under Sergeant Mize of the 2nd West Tennessee USA uh, were the uh, leaders of the 3rd Michigan Cavalry in a surprise attack on Clifton in which Colonel J.F. Newsom, seven officers, and 60 men were either killed or captured and the city of Clifton burnt to the ground. Y'all, it don't get better. It don't. I want to introduce you to somebody. His last name is Brown. And and um, he um, he's worth at least hearing his name. He really is. And um, this is all about the something you need to hear, but probably ain't got time for that today. Um Bear with me just a moment. Oh. Here's something you might want to know. Never mind. That's the wrong one. It's about um, it's about um, um, newspapers that existed here in uh, in Clifton. All right. Before the war, there was a gentleman that was in the United States Navy. His name was Lieutenant Isaac. In Brown. Now, this is a very important subject for all you fine people of Clifton. Isaac Newton Brown. Please try to remember that name. Isaac Newton Brown. He went around the earth, the globe, with the United States Navy three times in the U.S. Navy. When the Civil War broke out, he said he couldn't fight against the South, and he came home. He is the one that on Christmas Eve, 1861, Leonidas Polk, the Episcopal Bishop of Tennessee, said, you're gonna be our Navy officer on the Tennessee River, and the Cumberland River, and the Ohio River. And he said, we don't have any ships. And he said, oh, we'll make some. <laughs> All right, this was Christmas Eve, 1861. Our ships on the Tennessee River were destroyed in February, first week of February, 1862. Now they didn't get him. He wound up serving the rest of the war but they supposedly bought, okay, and we'll go along with that, a giant paddle wheeler, big one, 
up in Evansville, Indiana. Leonidas Polk did. They stole it. And they brought it to Sarah Gorder, Tennessee. Right down here where Pitts' store used to sit. And they stripped the two upper decks off of it. And they took every iron furnace in this country and started producing iron plating and almost had it completed to make it into an ironclad to take on that Yankee flotilla that, that Isaac Brown knew would come. He stayed at Clifton a lot, a lot, because of our iron furnaces here. To get the iron right. He had one big, big natural, it wasn't natural, it was a man-made defense that only, I guess, he could figure out how, how useful it was to him. And it was the railroad bridge up here at the mouth of the Duck River across the Tennessee River. He was there when the siege, when the gunboats came in February. That's where he was. And he got away. He got away. He got to Texas. He fouled up the works where the three Yankee gunboats he let the Tennessee, uh, let the Confederate gunboats get under the bridge, and then he lowered it, and then he fouled up all the works where it wouldn't raise again. So it gave the Tennessee boats about a four-hour headshot. They did get it working, and they got under there, but it gave them that little bit of time. Why it is so important this man reported to foot two times that they had neutralized the Confederate Navy on the Tennessee River and they had captured Isaac Newton Brown's official paperwork left in two different places. One was on our side of the river at the railroad bridge, the other was right here in Clifton. Admiral Foote, for some reason, didn't care anything about the paperwork here, but he wanted the paperwork from the railroad bridge. He looked at it, he wrote a report about it, and it disappeared. The paperwork that was here in Clifton, the rumor has always been shed that it is in a family's collection in Clifton or in a collection that the family moved from Clifton. Whichever the case may be, it's probably the most valuable documents that could exist from this town. Guarantee the U.S. Navy wants it. Guarantee it. Okay, because the guns, the cannons that were going to be placed on the East Port before the East Port was captured by the Union Navy and served the remainder of the war as a Union warship named the East Port, which was sunk by the Confederates before the end of the war. The cannons that Brown had for the East Port have never been found. They're somewhere between the river, Clifton, and present-day Olive Hill in a triangle, buried somewhere. That's a fact. They've never been found. And someday they will be found. And there was a very large, very large cannon and munitions that was going to go on that east port. That one round could hit one of those Yankee boats and they won't take another round. Okay? Enough about all that. But if anyone, that's why I said, please remember Isaac Newton Brown's name, please. And if somebody was to ever say, you know, I, there's a box of stuff that's got Brown's name on it. It's old. Let the radar come wide open, please. 
You won the lottery. You did. You really did. Okay. So now we're we're going to talk about a couple of things. Tawa, and I don't pronounce it correctly. T a w a h. Tawa. It's an Indian name. Okay. It is one of the later gunboats of the Union Navy. It's a bad, bad boat. Okay. It is stationed main place, Clifton. They started placing gunboats in strategic locations on the river so that Forrest would quit this crossing back and forth. All right, now we're going to get into this a little bit. Y'all have got, here in Clifton, some of the most amazing history that exists in the United States of America, and I, I'm not kidding you. you. The federal government even named it, and there was only two in the South, only two, and Clifton had one of them. Hydraulic Cement Furnace. And it's still standing on the Hassle Dowdy lot. And everybody says it's an iron furnace. Ain't no iron furnace. It's a cement furnace. How we're going to play this into the Civil War? <laughs> Our old buddy, our old buddy, Confederate old buddy, he decides that as big as this thing is, because it's got these huge silos made of rock and these huge warehouses made of rock. So he's going to put his whole unit in this thing and on this thing. And as the Tarawa moves, they're going to shoot it up and do. <laughs> the problem is they should have run. They should have left. They didn't. They're going to be heroes. The Tawa goes on upstream, gets on the far side of the river, and loads its guns and gets its infantry ready and comes down and blows that thing all to pieces, except for the furnace. And they land on our side of the river and disembark and come up there and have a horrible fight right there. I mean a bad one. It's one of the bloodiest fights in town Clifton. And the Yankees win. They burn it. <coughs> Everything about it. Now Clifton's already been burnt in the winter of 63. It's burnt. It's on the ground. Got two buildings standing. Which I want you to know right now we're fixing to address that because it is a lie. But they burned the hydraulic cement plant. The only thing left standing out there right now is the furnace on the Hassle Dowdy lot. That big pile of rock, it's got all them green bushes growing on it. That is a cement factory. They cooked cherry limestone from the bank of the river in that you can take this red limestone that's natural outcropping on the river and cook it down. I done it. I took it to the state lab. Oops. I took it somewhere and tested it, and it is perfect Portland cement. Perfect. You don't have to add nothing to it but gravel and water. Yep, sure enough. And it grows right here natural. Or be a factory here. To, anyway. Ah, so, <laughs> hey, hey. Me and him. <laughs> All right. But uh, it only grows between White Oak Branch in Prairie County and a Hardin's Creek on our side of the river. On the place. And the seam runs all the way to almost Lutes, Tennessee. Back that way. Okay. So you've got you've got that battle. Now you've got another another unknown battle in Clifton that is almost as bloody with the Tawa. The Tawa is making its way downstream. And this is three months, two and a half months, I guess after the cement thing. And the boys that got away from the cement thing, they ain't done with that tower. They want it again. So they get up here on the bluffs at Carroll, and when it's right under them, 
they let loose on it. Well, the tall one can't shoot up on them. It can't. There's no way. It can't bring those guns to bear, the cannons. So those Confederates are wearing that dude out. Okay? The Tawa goes down to Bogham Holler and parks, and they disembark. The Confederates ought to seen that boat park, but they didn't. And they're all celebrating the stuff, and here they come. So what Watton took out down here at the cement factory pretty well was up there. All right, so the Tawa, for it being hit two times in the river on both ends of town, decides it's time to show the people of Clifton what we're talking about. So it come up here, and right out here about where the ferry landing was, they floated coal barges to, to resupply all the Yankee boats. Didn't matter if it was a gunboat or a packet boat. It didn't matter. So they didn't have to come to the bank of the river because they had to stop coming to the bank of the river because they used to come and sleep. Well, the Confederates would jump on the boats. They didn't wake up. So then they started staying off the banks and they'd leave their lanterns lit. Well, the Confederates would come up on the banks and they'd see their silhouettes off. So now they can't light any lights. So they decide the best thing to do, since out in the river at Clifton right here, you've got a floating grist mill, a floating sawmill. Um, I can't remember what all's floating out here in the river that is owned by a fella by the name of uh, Shoat. Uh, uh, no, that's not right. Cade, Captain Cade. Captain Cade, which is in business with Captain Shoat, has got a floating sawmill powered by the river, a floating grist mill powered by the river, and, and a couple of other uh, things. I can't remember now what they are. So they just hook their coal barges onto that uh, state bin. And so that's where the men take liberty at out there on all of that. I guess it's a pretty good idea. So anyway, the Tawa comes back up here and it announces to Clifton that the citizens need to come to the bank of the river to see the punishment that the town of Carroll is going to receive. And if the people of Clifton don't come to the bank of the river and witness this, Clifton will receive the same. They already had. There wasn't nothing left. But there was a Carroll. Because Carroll started out a Union town. They were flying American flags and not Confederate flags. So the Union didn't shell them. Well, that day they did. And all the people came out and stood on the bank and watched the Union gunboats, and there were three at the time, shell Carroll. And the civilians were mostly old people and children. And they shelled them. And they couldn't get away. Okay, so enough about that. But Clifton has got, and Carol, this section of the Tennessee River has got one of the richest histories. It's got the richest history, minus, excuse me, minus a major battle like Shiloh or Murfreesboro, Chickamauga. But as far as, you know, that was a one-time thing. Shiloh wasn't. They fought it three times. Nobody knows about that. Excuse me. Get dry. So, um, I mean, we can go on and on and on. But it, it just, the, the thing to please remember is y'all are sitting on a wealth of knowledge that people all over, not just the United States, but the world, are beating their laptop computers to death trying to find any information they can find pertaining to all of this right here. And they can't find it. 
It is difficult to find. I'm going to say something, and I'm going to ask you to turn that off before I do. Because I don't want what I'm about to say be recorded in this bank. Okay, thank you. There is one book, and if you can get a hold of it, you won't have any more questions that was written about Clifton and Carroll and Tennessee River and the Civil War. It went out of print in 1880 something and it's never been reprinted and never will be reprinted. And if you can find it for sale, it is expensive. I had one. The name of the book, Slaveholders Rebellion. Probably not one you're familiar with. That's the name of the book. I'm not naming the book. I didn't create anything about it. That's the name of the book. It's a tough read. It's the Confederate version of what everybody said. That ain't what we stood for. That ain't what the South stood for. Well, that's what the book says. Slaveholders Rebellion. If you ever get an opportunity to lay your hands on it, jump on it with both feet. Thank you. That's all I got, guys. <laughs>